Today, we will be discussing Medicare, what you need to know for patient advocacy from a certified Medicare counselor perspective. And our host is Gerilyn Arneson. She is a certified Medicare benefits counselor through SHIP, the State Health Insurance Assistance Program. She volunteers at Senior Services of, of Southeastern Virginia Counseling, new to Medicare patients, prior active duty Air Force pharmacist, board certified oncology pharmacist, a revenue integrity pharmacist. Without further ado, here is Gerilyn. So I, I actually started my pharmacy career in the military and no, you know, you don't deal with any insurance at all. You don't, <laughs> everything is, is free to us. Um, and then um, after I got out, I worked as a civilian for various branches of the military. And then, um, so, um, so then um, in 2014, I, I came back from Germany and I decided I was gonna venture out into civilian pharmacy and joined a, a, you know, a large health system in Virginia and um, came, and, and I'm an oncology pharmacist by training, the Air Force trained me to be an oncology pharmacist. So um, I, they sent me over to this One Cancer Institute to, to open it up and I didn't know, I didn't know anything other than, you know, my usual, like making chemo and stuff like that. But what I did notice was um, patients were like not showing up for chemo and which is something that I really didn't um, ever run into in the military. So I would just like start randomly calling patients because I thought, well, maybe they just have transportation issues or whatever. So, um, you know, they would be like, well, they put me on Keytruda, nobody, talk to me about cost. And then I got two doses and now I'm 60 grand in debt. And I was like, oh, oh, I, like, I had no, you know, in hospital pharmacists in general, like really don't have any idea about the cost. So um, at the same time, I started having these FRMs come in and tell me about these programs. And I was like, this is weird. Like on this side, I've got these patients who are not coming in for treatment. On this side, I've got these these people telling me there's these programs like, I don't know what I'm doing, but let's I'm gonna slap them together and I'm gonna just go for it. And I just slowly built a program off of that. And um, it was my FRMs that helped me really, uh, honest to God. Um, and one FRM in particular, bless her heart, tried to get me to understand Medicare. And I was like, I, it, like two years went by and I was like, I still don't, I don't understand this. I still do not understand this. And so um, finally I, I was like, I was looking online. I was like, there has to be some sort of course I can take for Medicare to explain this to me. And I kept coming across like, well, if you want to become a broker or you want to do this or that, and I didn't want to become a broker. So I just kind of like lucked out and found um, senior services of Southeastern Virginia through the Department of Aging. And they had this program where you volunteer, like literally all you volunteer is four hours a week and they give you all this Medicare training. And then I shadowed the people who were doing it full time and learned it. And um, so honestly, it was out of just sure frustration just pure frustration that I was like, I don't know, I've got, because it's part of the patient and medication assistance journey. There's a lot of like rules that surround Medicare and, um, you know, so le there's some legal and compliance issues and whatnot, but I didn't even know the basics, you know, I was like, you know, I started hearing people talk like, well, if you change your Medicare plan, they wouldn't have to pay for this or that. And I was like, oh, really? You know, <laughs> so there's all this information out there. And then I think, you know, poor me, poor the patients, poor patients that never get any Medicare benefit counseling. So like what senior services does, and I love it, is they offer what's called new to Medicare counseling. So patients who are like three months before they turn 65, they offer this new to Medicare 
counseling. I feel like everybody that's about to turn 65 should, should have this counseling provided to them because otherwise what happens is they're like attacked in the Walmart parking lot by Humana, Humana rep, you know, like sign up for our no premium um, Medicare plan. And then now they've got a $7,000 out of pocket max that they, you know, it's like, oh, well, they told me it was no premium. They're like, oh, they didn't write and read the fine details about the $7,000. So, um, so my goal is to always be like very frank and open and honest with the patients about like, this is like, you go down these avenues, this is what you're looking at. So that's kind of how we're gonna approach this today. So um, no, I don't have any conflicts of interest with Medicare. I know that for sure. Um, <laughs> um, so we're gonna go through all the different parts of Medicare. We're gonna look, so here's, this was my biggest thing. Medicare Advantage plan versus a supplement. Could not grasp it, could not grasp it for the life of me. So we're gonna go through that. Um, we're also gonna talk about um, Medicare savings programs and the low income subsidy, which is also known as extra help. And we'll talk a little bit about M Medicare plan finder, which is kind of like mixed into the presentation, but I've got another presentation tomorrow on how to use the plan finder to lower the drug costs for your patients. So. So we'll kind of, we'll keep that a little bit short and talk about that more tomorrow. Okay, so the Medicare, cert, so to be a certified Medicare benefits counselor, you have to take these like 20 modules and you take an exam um, and we're certified through the state health insurance assistance program. Um, we do not receive a commission. I will tell you that I don't get paid <laughs> for doing this. Um, but I will tell you that I've gotten way far more out of it than I've put into it. Much, much more. So, and being like prior military, I, I actually like working with seniors. Like I like to work with the real crusty, the crusty old like vets that are like, you know, ready to brawl with you and whatever, because that like to banter. They're, they're fun. I mean, and, and really they get worked up about Medicare, you know, like, they're, they're going to come in over that $23 and 10 cents. Let me tell you, they will. So, um, okay. So I've got a website on here to find your ship in your um, state or local area. Um, it's usually through the Department of Aging. So the quiz is, patient says they have Aetna Medicare. What part of Medicare does this patient have? And I'm hearing a lot of C's, which would be correct. It's a Medicare Advantage plan. Okay, so here, here's our basics. Um, part A covers your hospital, um, covers your hospital, and co covers your SNF, um, covers some, some home health. Um, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll get into part A a little bit. Part B is your medical. So it's your output, your doctor's appointments. Um, your uh, physical OT therapy. Um, but the big one for us would be like infusions. So part B covers infusions. Um, and then they also cover some oral medications uh, like the immunosuppressants and uh, those types of things. Part C is the Medicare Advantage. Part C is not, it's, it's not really a part of Medicare. It's like a made up thing, but it's like A, B, and D smashed together is what part C is, Medicare Advantage. And then part D is your prescription drug coverage. Okay, so this is where I start, this is hard to see, but this is where I start when I'm gonna talk to a new to Medicare patient. What are my coverage choices? So you have two avenues you can run down. You can go with traditional Medicare A and B, which you get when you're, you have three months before you turn, you're to, you turn 65 the month, you turn 65 and three months after you turn 65. Now, if you stay employed past 65, you have the option to defer it, but we won't, you know, that's a, that's a whole other discussion. Um, 
So you get part A and B, but if you do that, that just covers hospital and medical. So then you're gonna have to, you're, unless your employee, sometimes your for, former employer will, will offer a part D, like a similar to a part D plan, but you're gonna need a prescription drug plan, so a part D plan. And then you're gonna need a supplement because if you don't have a supplement, that 20% from part B goes on and on and on and on with no cap. And that's where people get themselves into trouble. So there's that avenue. Then the other avenue is, I just want everything smashed together in one. And I just want A, B, and D all smashed together. The problem is this is where the fine details are not explained to the patient. You know, what exactly um, that consists of. So you can actually get a Medicare Advantage plan without a prescription drug program. There are some Medicare Advantage plans like that. So like if your employer, your former employer offers a Part D, um, you can substitute it for that. Um, there's also, it's not, um, it, it's uh, if they have, oh, I can't remember the name of it, like a health savings account. They have a health safe, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, those those types of Medicare Advantage plans, they don't have a Part D, so it allows you to use that money to, to pay for your prescriptions. Um, okay, so this is just a lot of this stuff is like I'm just a very visual person, so I put a lot of stuff in the slides um, just for your reference. But for Part A, all I want you to take away is that 1484 which is the deductible that they have to pay every time they're admitted. And so um, if they have 60 days in between admissions, they have to keep paying that 1484. So just keep that in mind as we go down this path about uh, whether we wanna go the route of the supplement or we wanna go the Medicare Advantage plan. Um, also, you have to have a three-day qualifying hospital stay in order to get your SNF paid for. So that's another, that's another big thing. The SNF, a skilled nursing facility, sorry. Um, but you can see what um, the cost breakdown is for um, what they have to pay and you know we don't we don't see a lot of patients in the hospital past 30 60 days anymore but with covid that's kind of changing um so if they just have part a or they have part a and b with no supplement they could really and they're you know like i'm also so right now i'm out of the revenue integrity and out of the patient assistance and i'm back into pharmacy operations um, manager role at my hospital and we just got frequent flyers coming in frequent flyers coming in um because we don't do a good job with transition to care keeping them out of the hospital yeah so you know i'm just i'm just say it flat out we <laughs> you know we don't do a good job with it um so the patients who don't have any sort of protection they really can get themselves into some trouble so Okay, part B. So again, the big one is the infusions. And um, so let's see how, so when I wanted to talk about the cost of these infusions, like especially for chemotherapy or immunotherapy for cancer or any sort of infusion for like rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, um multiple sclerosis uh anytime they get ivig so basically what happens is they get charged 20 percent of whatever the contractual payment rate is between the hospital and the insurance company or between the hospital and medicare so let's say um you know and the hospitals again being transparent, the hospitals jack up the prices by five, six hundred percent. So they might charge 
you know, 60,000 for a $10,000 drug, but Medicare is only going to pay 20,000. So they have to pay 20% of that 20,000. So that could be $4,000 and Keytruda is like every four weeks. So if they just, if they show up on my schedule and I see Medicare A and B only, I'm like, I already know, I'm gonna look in this patient's account. He's gonna be in debt over hundred grand. I can already, you know, I can just, I can just look at the schedule and I can just see what kind of Medicare they have. And I can already predict like what, you know, what kind of debt they're gonna be in. Um, so part B also covers the doctor's services, any sort of outpatient care, um, some home health. Um, the part B yearly deductible is only $203, which isn't a big deal. Um, it's that 20% that, that gets them. Okay, so part C, the Medicare Advantage, these are offered by, by private insurance companies. Most of them, it all kind of depends on the area of the country that you live in. And let me like preface this whole talk by saying it depends on what state you live in. So, because I've, I've made that mistake before by not making that disclaimer, and then I'll start getting messages like, well, in New York, they do, like, they don't carry, or they don't count burial. I'm like, yeah, I know, I know, okay. So it depends on what state. So, um, but most of the Medicare Advantage plans are HMOs, PPOs, or the um, private fee-for-service, which means they'll accept Medicare, but they charge, they can charge up to 15% higher than the Medicare allowable rate. And then the patient has to pay that difference. So, but it, it's kind of like a PPO. It just allows it a little bit more choices, a little more flexibility. So um, they've got to use the, the doctors and hospitals in the, in the plans networks. Um, again, combines A and B and D. Dental hearing vision benefits covered. I should I should put like well kinda. Uh, <laughs> um, you know it's it's really it's really really hard for me to believe that that we that Medicare still does such a crappy job of covering vision dental and hearing like it's your most needed thing in this population. And, you know, so I will go from plan to plan to plan looking like maybe somebody just gives a little bit more dental benefits or vision benefits, but they all stink, they all stink. And then you can buy an additional rider through the plan um, and it still stinks. <laughs> so, you know, I'm still like, Kind of like trying to figure out whether paying for the rider is worth it or not. I don't know. Um, so, I but I've heard rumors that that's changing, that they're going to address that, which I, I hope to see. The deductibles and the cost sharing for the services, they vary by plan. Um, that's kind of why we'll, you, we'll, we'll look at Plan Finder in a little bit more depth tomorrow so you can see how you can compare the different plans to each other. Um, they still have to, so when, this, this is what irritates me about these people in the Walmart parking lots, is when they say it's premium free, it's not premium free. They still have to pay the $148.50 premium for Part B which is taken out of their social security check. So a lot of them, when they find that out, they're like, well, I, I thought it was premium free. And I was like, yeah, well, that's what, don't talk to people in Walmart parking lots ever <laughs> under any circumstances <laughs> for any reason. Um, so I kind of call it a, it's more of like a pay as you go type of plan. Um, but the annual out-of-pocket max, the average for in-network for 2021 is 7550 So it's still pretty steep. Um, so, you know, some of them, the healthy older seniors could be perfectly fine for this. They'll, ne they'll never reach that $7,550. Um, 
so you know it just depends on on what kind of health conditions they have no it's 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 like it's, it's everything except for part d so part d is still like the cost sharing for part d is is so it's kind of like yeah it is this is this is confusing so like you would it makes you think because a b and d is all like in there together that the part d um prices would be also included in that 7550 but it's not it's a separate it's a separate pot of money um so the 7550 covers your part a so that's what part a and part b contributes towards that 7550 yeah so this is just um like a example of what you'd see when you so when you get to the plan finder, you can do you can do two ways. If you if you have your patient, now I, I don't know about you guys, but my patients are like the ones that aren't at senior services when I help them at the hospital, like especially during COVID, they'll literally give me passwords to <laughs> Social Security Administration and you know their Medicare. They're just like figure it out for me, just you know whatever. Um, so anyway, so you can actually create an account on mymedicare.gov for the patient. And what you need is their red, white, and blue card. You need their um, Medicare number off the red, white, and blue card. You need the date, the month, and the year that their Part B benefits started. And you also need their zip code. So you can do it that way to get more accurate results, or you can just do a general thing based on their zip code and not create an account and just kind of um, you know search search for plans. But this is you know um, what they'll do is they'll list a long long list of um, plans and then you can select what plans you can you can select one plan and really look in depth at it or you can do side by side comparisons. But this would be kind of like what you would see for for one of the plans that gives you the deductible and and an estimated so you you can also type at that first screen you can type in their prescription medications that's that's another benefit of it so whether you have their medicare information or not you can still type in you know they've got lipitor they've got insulin they've got whatever you can type in all their prescriptions and then it'll kind of give you a little estimate of what their drug costs are going to be so yeah, so I would say the plan finder is good, but it's almost like you have to follow up and then go to the plan's website to make sure that they take that provider because um, that's very important to patients. They don't want to change providers. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's right, that's right. No, it's a very good point, very good point. Um, so then, so I, I went into the Anthem MediBlue Plus and this is, I, I did an in-depth breakdown of what the cost share is gonna be. So I know it's really bad and my eyesight is really bad. So um, we've got the Part B premium of 148.50, the deductible is 750, drug deductible $95. They, based on what prescriptions I typed in, they estimated their yearly prescription drug costs were gonna be about $3,000. And um, the max they would pay for health services um, was going to be seventy five fifty in network. So, so this was a PPO plan. And then here's where it starts giving you a breakdown of the um, doctor's visits, specialist visits, MRIs, X-rays. Um, on here it was. Okay, in network zero to forty dollar copay, out of network thirty five percent coinsurance. That's pretty typical for a PPO. Um, labs for Medicare are typically free, um, and then you know emergency care ninety dollar copay per visit, urgent care forty five dollars. So it gives you all of those breakdowns, and those 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 things differ from plan to plan. So. Basically, if, if your deductible goes up, then those services will go down, you know, and vice versa. Yeah, I would, I would say so. You know, a lot of 
patients get hung up on not wanting to pay a deductible because they have to pay 100% of that, whatever that first bill is, they have to pay 100% and they have a real hard time seeing that $750, which I understand, yeah, like, because you know everybody's threshold is different, right? Like, you know, hundred dollars to I. My first patient at the hospital I'm at now. She was making. She had uh, Crohn's disease. She's getting um, Social Security benefits. She was totaled eight hundred eighty-eight hundred dollars a year. She's living off eighty-eight hundred dollars a year and um had no I, I had no idea how she was even like surviving like how she's getting food or whatever so like i just signed signed her up for everything the signed her up for medicaid snap everything everything i could think of and you know that gave her back that 148.50 for the medicare part b and it's like for me that wouldn't be a big deal but for somebody that makes 8800 dollars like a 148 an extra 148.50 is huge no, I well, so QMB is one way to do it, um, which we will we'll talk about that. But Medicaid isn't. I I thought she met the threshold for full age blind disabled Medicaid. She met the eighty percent threshold, so I was like, I'm the signer up for Medicaid. So yeah. Um. So here's some more uh, benefit or costs. Oh wait, no, we went through that, and then. Yeah. Okay. So um, you can see the hospital coverage is a little bit different than um, original part A. So, and again, that's all gonna change based on the plan. But this is the kind of info that you'll find in the plan finder. Okay, so let's switch to supplement plans. The other thing I like couldn't grasp was like a Medigap is the same thing as a supplement. And people kept using it interchangeably. And I was like, Medicare Advantage, so, so, like they all sound the same they all have the same name you know like you can have a you can have an Aetna Medicare Advantage plan you can have an Aetna supplement and then throw the word med stop, like stop using med I, I don't know can we just stick to two terms please so um so a lot of patients come in and they don't they already have it made up in their mind they don't want to go the supplement route because they've already heard the premiums are higher. Um, but what it does is it pays, depending on which plan, there's different letter plans for the supplements, but depending on which plan they choose, it picks up the remaining costs, including that 20% that A and B doesn't cover. So you can't use the Advantage plan with the supplement. Um, and when it comes to whether something is covered by a supplement it has to be covered by medicare in order for it to get covered by the supplement um and then we're going to look at these we're going to look at the plans here um in a minute but each lettered plan has to offer the same benefit so keep that in mind for like two slides from now each lettered plan has to provide exactly the same benefit Okay, plan G, we like to call that the Cadillac plan because it like pays for just about everything. Okay, so here's different lettered plans. Um, again, so F is no longer offered, but G is offered and it picks up everything except for the part B deductible. So it pays for all the part A and part B coinsurances um, except for that $203 Part B deductible. Yeah. Uh
This is where your supplement would save you. So the problem is um, if you... No, advantage, yeah, so you get... Advantage is the part C and you, so you would pay that, the, the SNF rate up to that like 75, 50 or whatever that cap is. Um, but, or you, so you'd have the part C, the advantage, what is, sounds like the United is, um, or you'd have the supplement, which picks up, you pay your monthly premium, but it picks up everything. Yeah. To add to add to hers. Um, however, being in a SNF, technically speaking, they have up to a hundred days. Right. They don't kick them out, right? So, for example, if your father, right, your father was in a SNF, and they're telling you that um, you won't have. Does have longer than 20 days, according to Medicare. They have 100 days. They're just going to pay for 20 days. Yeah. Well, well no, not necessarily. Because um, I have a client right now that's in that, mm -hmm. that umbrella. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but they have to go back to Medicare to get approval. So if your father is in a SNF and that's all they really technically want to keep them there. But if he's not approving, they're going to want to move them out. Okay. Or you keep them there, but then you're going to put the bill because they don't want to go back to Medicare and then look back on them. So because it's not your So like tomorrow, one of the things that we could do with the plan finder is we could compare Medicare Advantage plans and see what the, how much um, the SNF costs on days such through such, such through such, you know, there's like three, you know, three tiers usually. So, so that, you know, if you, if you anticipated like your parent or your patient needing, being readmitted frequently and go, needing SNF treatment, that would be one of the things you'd want to compare between the plans. We're going, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. I know you guys are a good audience. You, you got good questions. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, here are the Medigaps. What I want you to look at, like, let's just look at G slash G plus, which is on the right hand side. And just go down that list and look at the price differences. Okay, so I don't know, my, um, the very first one, we'll go to the second one because that, that one's for male and female. The yearly premium is $1,630. But then I go down two more to NAIC Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield and the annual premium is $1,176. So remember I was saying each lettered plan has to provide the same services. So there, and this is, this is one page. There's like a whole booklet <laughs> of these plans. And it's just really about the patient not be, you know, like they just get called, they just get hammered by brokers, you know, is the problem. And they don't know that they can shop around. Um, and so the premiums don't have to be that high. <laughs> I have a client, uh, GSI, Medicare, uh -huh. and then Joe Nate. I don't know. <laughs> see, I've seen him on TV too, yeah. Uh -huh. so, if she has switched them, I'm going to switch them all the time. Okay. So, over and over at that Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys a hint ahead of time, because we, we will talk about this. Here's like one little... If this is like the, this is the best golden nugget, 
that I'm going to give you. If you have a patient who's in a Medicare Advantage plan that's stuck in a Medicare Advantage plan that really stinks, um, and you need to, so like let's say their prescription some because the formulary can change at any time with no notice so and now you need to get their prescription covered you can change them to a five-star plan any time of the year can you say plan finder so if they're stuck in a crappy medicare plan which most of them are and you want to change them outside of open enrollment which is october 15th to december 7th you can switch them to a five-star plan any time of the year i did it for my dad yes i did it for liz's mom as well yeah <laughs> So, um, what the the five star plan? Okay, so if they're in a in a bad, I'll try to be more PC. If they're in a bad Medicare plan, bad, bad Medicare Advantage plan, and like it suddenly doesn't cover whatever prescriptions they're on, and you go to Plan Finder and you want to you you want to find a plan that covers your prescription drugs, you can sign them up for a five-star plan any time of year. Otherwise, if you don't do that, you can only change them October 15th to December 7th. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and there, uh, you know, there there are more five star plans out there than you would think because they're all competing. They're all competing for each other. Um, so I've yet to not be well. I think there's like once where I couldn't find a five star plan, and but we weren't too far away from open enrollment, so we felt like we could we could wait it out. No, no, not necessarily. No. It, the the star rating really has to do with a lot of customer service issues. Yeah. Nope. Yeah, October fifteenth to December seventh. So, so like, if you got anybody in a bad Medicare plan coming up, is the time to to change them. Yeah. Oh, oh, good God. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. All right. So let's see, what can we burn through? Let's, let's go to the, okay. So I'll leave this in here. So the, the problem with supplement plans is you can't, you can't change supplements the way you change Medicare Advantage plans. You've, you've got a very short window to change or to, to enroll in a Medicare supplement without being subjected to underwriting. That's the key. So if you don't get them in that window and they have cancer or some other chronic illness, those premiums are going to go, they, they could get into a supplement, but it's going to skyrocket. So that six month window after they turn 65 or they enroll in Medicare. Um, so they have to be 65 and have Medicare Part B. That six month window is when they're not subject to medical underwriting. So that's key. Yeah, so when they're both 65 and have Medicare Part B, they have six months to enroll in a supplement without being subjected to medical underwriting. Then the other, the second little nugget is that if they're in a Medicare Advantage plan and it's crappy for a whole year and they hate it, you have just, just that one time to be able to enroll them into a supplement. 
Nobody knows about that either. That's also a very short window. So you have 63 days to yank them out of the Medicare Advantage plan and get them into a supplement without being subjected to underwriting. Yeah, so it's like they're already enrolled in Humana Medicare and they're like, oh, this stinks and whatever. And I, now, I just, now I got diagnosed with cancer. I changed my mind. You got one year. So you got one year from signing up from that Medicare Advantage plan to get them into a, into a supplement. This is just kind of um, comparing the two side by side. Um, this is, you know, if you're confused, like I was, like how do you how do you figure out what's an advantage versus a supplement? Like it's it, in the advantage ones, they're going to say like um, they're going to have the word advantage in it, or um, they're going to say Aetna Medicare. It'll say PPO, HMO, whatever. Or if they have a supplement, their primary is always going to be A and B, and then the supplement is going to be like. You think of it, you know, like late night infomercials, like Colonial Pen, but <laughs> those are actually the names of the of the supplements. Um, so Mutual of Omaha, Colonial Pen, AARP, those are all supplements. So, um, but Medicare pays first, and then the supplement picks up the rest. Okay, Part D. Um, these are also run by private uh, insurance companies. Um, they all have different formularies, cost structures. Um, so oh, as a pharmacist, you say how to break this down. Okay, so each, each Part D plan, has, everybody know what a formulary is? Okay, so you've got the, the baseline formulary and they, they have to have two drugs of, of each class on that formulary. So like, let's, ACE inhibitors. They have to have, let's say, lisinopril and ramipril, but they don't have to have bacinopril. So they have to have two. So that's kind of how that works. But then after they have the baseline formulary, then they have, um, they break the drugs down into tier levels. And that's going to, that's going to affect how much they pay in the initial coverage phase. Um, the plan can raise the copay at any time they can switch the formulary at any time and they just send them like a 30 day notice like hey by the way we're no longer covering this drug <laughs> and then some but not all plans offer insulin for 35 dollars a month which is pretty huge um and then again the key is open enrollment october 15th so here's an example of the drug tiers um and you can see the specialty drugs, which are the most expensive, they can be 25 to 33 percent. And then this is as basic as I could break it down for you, but the initial deductible they pay a um, $445, they pay 100 percent of that. So like let's say they go to the pharmacy and they have to get um, an insulin that's not covered under that, that um, 30 day rule and it costs $500, they have to pay $445 for that first bill. So you see a lot of prescription abandonment because of that. Um, then after they reach their deductible, then there's the initial coverage period. That's where the tier levels come in. So they have to spend out of their own pocket up to $4130 um, before they go into the coverage gap. It's not the donut hole, it's now the coverage gap. They just wanna make it sound nicer. Um, and then it changes so that it's 25% of both brand and generic until they hit 6550. And then that's when they hit the catastrophic cap. And then they pay the greater of 5% coinsurance or um, the $3.70 or $9.20 after 6550 is reached. And you think that's low. However, with some of these specialty meds, 5% is very, yeah, it's very costly. So those patients need help too. Okay, so this is where um, LIS, low income subsidy, is the same thing. Again, supplement Medigap, LIS, extra help, same thing. So just think of them as, as the same thing. There are so, yeah, so many patients that qualify for extra help. Um, 
it's unreal because if you, this is the way I think about it. If they're the working poor, they turn into the elderly poor. So, um, so this is a, a program that's through the Social Security Administration. And um, if they're not on Medicaid, um, they, you know, like there, there are tons of patients that fall through the cracks and never get screened for this and are eligible. Um, but the good thing is if they qualify for extra help, they have um, the ability to switch their Part D plan more frequently. Medicare savings programs, and then and then we can we can get into that. But so there's a couple of ways to sign. There's there's quite a few ways to sign patients up for extra help. You can go through the Social Security Administration. It's very easy. It's like it takes five ten minutes. Um, you can go to um, the benefits checkup. I really like this website. It's really easy to use through the National Council on Aging. Um, and then the, I didn't put it in here, but the last one is PAN Foundation. Has everybody heard of PAN? PAN has this extra help screening tool as well. And they also provide like a list of documents that the patient will probably need to, to send in. Okay, Medicare savings programs. This is another thing that's underutilized that's available out there, but it's, it's a state program. Each state has a program that helps pay for Medicare costs. Um, there's four, four different types. Um, you can you can enroll them. So some states you have to enroll on a paper form. Some states you can enroll online. But the thing is, if they qualify for extra help, they're gonna uh, they're gonna qualify for some form of a Medicare savings program, and vice versa. So this is in your slides. This is for the state of Virginia, but I think it's pretty typical. Um, these are the income cutoff limits for. Um, QMB. So QMB is for, let's see, uh, they're 100% of the poverty limit. So it's almost, if you don't want to sign a patient up for Medicaid, sign them up for QMB because it's bas you basically get the same benefits without having the headache of Medicaid. Um, and then uh, it gets a little bit less as you go down the line. Um, but you can, you can go back and refer to that as to uh, what the income cutoff limits. I, I keep this sheet with me all the time when I'm screening patients. Like, cause if they're, if they're bringing me in at, you know, tax returns or whatever, pay, pay stubs, and I'm screening them for patient assistance, I'm gonna screen them for this stuff at the same time. So, okay, medication assistance for Medicare patients. I've heard so many people say, get free drugs for Medicare patients. <laughs> and um, so here, th this is the way that I categorize it. Like I, I picture it in like the schedule when I see patients on the schedule. If, and you would, you would not believe the number of patients who just have part A because they don't know any better. So if they're part A, consider them uninsured. Just consider them uninsured. They're gonna need free drugs. Um, and then, yeah, you know, I won't even get into like what it's going to take to get them on part B and the part B penalty that they're going to have to pay and the part D penalty that they're going to have to pay. So just treat them as uninsured and go for free drugs. Um, if they have Medicare A and B only, no supplement, no advantage plan, they have an unlimited 20% coinsurance with no cap. So I'm going to go after free drug on these patients too. You could go. You could you could go the foundation route if the foundation has enough money to cover. But it would be tough. It would be really tough. Like there's maybe you know maybe some multiple myeloma foundations out there that might might cover it. But 
Usually I go for free drug for these patients. And then, okay, so patients with Medicare Advantage plans. So here's where, here's where it gets sticky. What I've witnessed is once people find out you can get free drug for Medicare patients, that is the path of least resistance. That is easier. People want to go down that road all the time. And also it makes your numbers look better. I'm just to see it. I'm, not, I'm, I'm like the most blunt person you're ever going to meet. If you're tracking numbers at your institution, it's going to make your numbers look better if you go free drug for Medicare um, Advantage patients. The right thing to do, though, is to get them into a foundation because that foundation will pick up their out-of-pocket mass. So every time I file, so let's say their out-of-pocket max is 7,000 and they owe 1,000 every three weeks, I'm going to apply every three weeks for $1,000 until I hit that 7,000. Because what happens when I hit that 7,000? The rest of their services are paid for. Now they can go get a surgery. Now they can go get an MRI. Now they can go get all the stuff done that they've been putting off. That's the right thing to do. So it irritates me when I see programs that just go straight for free drug because it's not in the, you're doing this because you're supposed to be doing what's in the best interest of the patient. And doing that extra work is what is in the best interest of the patient. Now, I know a lot of the foundations, the funds are closed a lot of times. But now a lot of them have wait lists. Put your patients on every wait list. Put them on every wait list. And then do what I do, like pull over on the side of the road and I get my laptop out and I sign them up for the foundation as soon as I get like the text from FundBinder or whatever. So use free drug until you can get them into a foundation, then get them into the foundation. Because once they're in the foundation, they stay in the foundation as long as you keep re-enrolling them. So, you just got to get them in there. Um, okay, so if they have a supplement, they're really not going to need patient assistance. These are the patients I like to see on my schedule. I'm like, all right, good. Okay, supplement, I can move on. Um, state pharmaceutical assistance programs. Every state is different. In Virginia, we have one for HIV. I have actually never been successful using a state pharmaceutical assistance program. <laughs> Just be honest about it. I'm not saying they don't work, but I myself have not been able to make one work, but they are available. Okay, so Medicare insurance optimization. So this in my in my mind, free drug is not going to last forever, people. Free drug and copay assistance becoming a huge conflict of interest. It's not going to be around forever. So we have got to find a different way to help these patients and insurance optimization is the way to do that. So insurance optimization means if they have part A, I need to get them into Medicare Advantage or something. I've got to do, you know, Medicare part A and B, Medicare Advantage. If they're Medicare A and B only, I've got to get them into a Medicare Advantage. So I at least cap them out. You know, otherwise I'm looking at patients in debt who are 30, 40, 50, $60,000 in debt. And so the right thing to do is to get them into a Medicare Advantage plan because they just were never educated on Medicare. Um, then I guess, you know, best case scenario, if you can, and I have had some of these patients who come to me and they're like, I'm gonna be turning 65 soon. What do I do? And I'm like, well, we need to talk. Like my infusion patients, I'm like, we need, we need to have a serious talk. Like, don't, please don't talk to anybody at Walmart. Like we need to, <laughs> um, we, I, you know, like I, I, they have cancer or they have a chronic health condition like Crohn's or where they're hospitalized a lot or multiple sclerosis, whatever. I'm sorry, I'm steering them towards, towards a supplement. Um, and then, uh, the last piece would be for insurance optimization is screen all your patients for LIS and extra help and Medicare savings programs. It, like I said, they're already bringing you their income. You may as well just make it part of your process. 
So the plan finder again, um, it's uh, medicare.gov. And that is it for me. I think I only, because I, I tend to run long, I apologize. So I think I only ran, <laughs> I ran a little bit long. Um, but does anybody have any questions for Geraldine before I boot her off the podium? <laughs>